Um, so you'll be hearing in a moment from shipwrights, timber experts, wooden boat enthusiasts, the Minister for Resources, um, and they're here, Tim Phillips, Lockie, um, Ian at the end, and Captain Sarah there, and then Hannah and um, Peter Harris. I'm um, going to introduce, if you like, the context of what we're saying, um, and, and afterwards I'm more than happy to be corrected. <laughs> but there is a passion in this debate, and, and if you think of Tasmania as the stewards of the Australian um, Wooden Boat Festival, we have that because of the enthusiasm and the passion, because we are an island culture, we're surrounded by waterways, we have remarkable wooden boat heritage and culture here, and importantly, this is built on our unique world-class boat building specialty timbers, such as, as you all know, Celery Top, Hugh and, and King Billy. So this has given rise to a valuable industry, um, as well as a cherished and valuable intangible culture and heritage. The, the careful stewarding um, of these things and this remarkable timber has given rise to uh, these valuable community, cultural and fiscal assets. And I think the official sort of words uh, would be, the definition would be, it's really easy to stuff it up. So the Wooden Boat Festival makes a remarkable contribution, as many of you know, to the, uh, to the Tasmanian economy. And I don't think it's useful to get bogged down in dollars only because the intrinsic and intangible values are most important. However, the instrumental or economic value is also important and it's very important to bean counters uh, from, from various departments who do a great job for Tasmania. Cold data could indicate that there is 30 million as a sort of a base point and I'm not going to take it past that, the discussion. What is clear is that there is tons of human data that we're witnessing across the way there. Data of intangible culture and heritage. Data of hotel beds and visitation and dinners and buying that slightly more expensive bottle of Pinot than you intended to. Um, the supply chains, the status of the destination, the joy and the freedom and the celebration and the mental health and the physical health and the return visits and the industry and all of those things combined to speak louder than mere dollars and cents. So the figure is many times higher than that, and we're doing some work to um, quantify that in future for governments. The minister recognises, and we'll speak later on video, that the festival, the industry and the culture of wooden boat building is a sophisticated and enviable part of our economy. And it's dependent on access to and continued supply of sustainable um, and vital amounts of specialty boat building timber. Without this availability, the Wooden Boat Festival will shrink. It'll lose significance. Valuable young careers will die and the Wooden Boat Festival will be severely diminished. It'll wither to something of an arcane, grey-bearded anachronism ignored by the rest of the world. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say we are close to the brink of that if the people who pull the policy levers don't get it right, and secondly, we don't support them positively to get it right. And as a member of the board, with other board members here, part of the reason for this forum and the passion is that that is a, an old-fashioned risk to the festival. So we're very privileged to have these speakers here um, to share their knowledge from uh, beginnings of careers to the ends of careers. And first of all, just going to call, to, with the future focus, call on Lockie to speak first. Um, Lockie is an up and coming Tasmanian boat builder. He recently worked with Andrew Denman on the beautiful Teapunga. Um, uh, he's a handsome chap. Um, he, he's here to talk to us um, with passion. So speak from your heart. Lockie, tell us the stuff, tell us about the future, tell us about your career. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> um, this is good. I absolutely love public speaking, so really pumped about that. And I love the Wooden Boat Festival, so it's really good to see everyone out and about. But uh, I just want to speak on behalf of uh, the next generation of boat builders, I feel like, and give my reason to the why I think we should have access to these beautiful timbers. 
Um, but yeah, I've been boat building for about eight years and uh, recently, yeah, did the Tirupunga rebuild, which if you haven't seen it yet, you should. <laughs> and it's hard not to feel like I've caught the tail end of the dream. Um, I never thought I would build anything other than strip plank, timber boats or dinghies. So getting to Tirupunga was a dream to build a carvel boat of that style to that standard. Um, but it's hard to see the, that dream in the end of the tunnel. And I'm at a point in my career where um, I want to take boat building back to the northwest coast of Tassie. I want to start my own shop. I want to teach the skills I've learned and carry the tradition on. Um, but I just don't know why I take the gamble at this point. I don't know if I can get the timber. I don't know if I can get the people behind me to support it. And I don't want to import timber from the other side of the world and ship it here and clean some weird sawdust out of my dust extractor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the access I have to timber at the moment seems like I could make plenty of money cutting beautiful hewn pine into chopping boards and selling to you at the market, which I hate. <laughs> And the other thing I wanted to talk about was the importance of wooden boats and this culture for young people. And I think uh, the responsibility of owning and maintaining a wooden boat isn't just for the grey beards or the elite. You can do it on a budget. You can learn really practical skills. You have a very, very strong mindset, you make good decisions, you reef early, you know the waterways, you can navigate under wind, and you don't bash around on a jet ski or in a tinny and just haul it back up at the boat ramp and you're done. You, you maintain, you check on your boat. When there's a storm coming, you make sure you drive past your mooring and make sure it's still there. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> and if we lose boat building, we're just going to lose all this beautiful history that we have and it's going to be a real shame and uh, I don't want to let that happen so I think everyone here and people who put these events on in the boat festival it's, it's great to see but it's going to be great to see young people coming through and sort of keeping it all going with the support of uh, people like Ian who convinced me to talk in front of everyone. But I'm sure there is a way to, to find enough timber. I'm not talking about all the timber. We just need enough to keep us all going. And uh, I think that'd be really great. But I'd love to keep talking, but I've actually got to go sailing on the Derwents for the World Championships. <laughs> And um, you can find me through Denman Marine or you can just flag me down on the street and come and have a look at the Derwents. It's a group of uh, seven of us plus many more who've um, trying on a budget to revive a class. And this year we have seven Derwent classes at the festival, which is the most we've had for decades. Um, and we've all pitched in together and we've helped maintain and fix these boats to get them here and uh, we are looking for funding and uh, we're looking to do much what Tim's done with the Cuda boats. We want to save this Tasmanian heritage fleet that's um, going to be almost 100 years old at the next festival so we want to get them all back in sailing. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Lockie. Excellent words. Um, next up, uh, you know who's coming. He's already stood up because, you know, life and leadership. See you, buddy. See you, mate. See you, water. <laughs> um, Tim, I, I, I don't know that I need to introduce you. You are known, I'm sure, by everybody. But if you could talk to us about your passion, about the culture, about what 
gets you up in the morning, about what terrifies you of having 50 employees or whatever you've got, when you're looking at that, that line coming at you and you know, this is, we're going to run out of timber, we're going to run out of supplies, we're going, to, we're going to run out of money, or whatever it is, the pressures you're under, we'd love to hear what it means to have your experience. Thanks. Thank you. He's a good man, that Lockie. I tried to get him up to Victoria about six months ago and offered him a very lucrative job, but uh, he's very Tasmanian, so he decided to stay. Um, mine is a very narrow, focused uh, few words that I'm talking about. I'm not uh, talking to the, uh, to the photographs on the screen there. They're just... Um, uh, uh, photographs of sort of what we do at the wooden boat shop. But what I'm really talking about is our usage of timber within our business. We started, we, I built the first boat at the wooden boat shop in 1981, but before that our family were very friendly with the Laco family and we were quite close and I was in, there's a boat down at the dock there called Moonbird. Uh, a, a, a um, yellow painted cray boat that's been there forever or for a long time and uh, that was my first effort into securing timber to build a boat for my uncle Johnny back in 1976. So the t she's all built of celery top pine and there was a clog shop going uh, broke at the time so he, he purchased the timber and I went to my friend Mac Donzi up in Orbost in Victoria and got all the hardwood for the keel stem stern and, and, and well timber. And I was as green as grass in those days and knew a little bit about building houses, but very little about building boats. And so very soon after that, I met Alec Laco down at Mornington Pier and he was just at the end of his boat building career and he was launching a new carvel built, one of his 28 foot launches. And he said, Tim, he said, it's all finished. I can't, can't get the timber anymore. There won't be any more wooden boats built. And I would have just loved to had a chat with him, you know, five or six years ago. We've probably built, um, I think we're up to just about 120 wooden boats and most of those are substantial boats as you can see us working on here. Um, and we employ, we do employ a lot of people, uh, about um, 40 or 50 people, all, all skilled tradesmen, of not just boat builders, but we in, in employ uh, fitters and, and um, boiler makers and sail makers and that sort of thing. So we do everything, everything in the boat. But just to get back onto the timber, we first started using mostly Tasmanian timbers back in the 1980s and we'd come over here and we'd speak to Bob Crane from Western Softwoods and the Morrisons. We bought some timber from the Morrisons and the Bradshaws and and we'd have it shipped over there and it was always a bit of a hassle because it had come out of a, a, a wet environment and we'd have to dry it out and that's, that sort of thing. But we persevered for about 20 years on the Tasmanian timber and we built a lot of boats out of it. I'm almost embarrassed at the number of boats we made out of hue and pine, but I think it had probably number about 40 of them and some of them were quite big boats. And it was readily available in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. They were flooding Lake Peter and IXL had a lot of logs there in the, in the water. Um, and, and they didn't know really what to do with them or they had no idea of the, the value of them. And you know, I hope I'm not speaking too out of turn, but it was quite a, in my view, a, a poorly managed resource as far as specialty boat building timbers were concerned. And, We'd go down and we'd, we'd seek, I'd see Cowboy and there'd be a few packs of timber laying down there, beautiful hue and pine, and you'd sort of say to him, what about that pack, Cowboy? And he'd sort of look at you and he said, well, if you paid me, if you, if you paid me some cash, I might be able to uh, send it over to you. It was obviously cut for someone else. 
but so it was sort of a little bit corrupted, you know, too. And if you sort of put the money on the table, you'd, you'd get it sent over. So for all those years, we used a lot of specialty Tasmanian timbers. We probably built eight or ten boats out of King Billy Pine, mostly sourced from uh, Burn Brad Bradshaw. All the hue and pine was sourced from uh, Western Softwoods. And it was, you know, it was fantastic. And we thought that it would just keep happening. But all of a sudden, during the 90s, the resource started to tighten up. And, and, and um, it became more difficult to procure. So we sort of looked elsewhere and in one day walked a rep from a fairly uh, large importation company and, and he said, well, look, we have a lot of West African timbers. Um, would you consider these? And we knew nothing about West African timbers and started looking up on the internet and in books and that sort of thing, Aroco and Sedrata and Sedrella and all sorts of all, all sorts of timber that I'd, I'd never heard of and had a look at the durability of them and they started to look all right. So we, in the early 2000s, we swung over to a lot of imported timber. In the meantime, we did use uh, some Fijian cowry. We sourced a fair bit of Fijian cowry. But to give you an idea, Ian, on the amount of timber that we probably use in the wooden boat shop, it's not all that much for the number of people that we employ. We probably estimate that we probably use about 30 cube a year, or, or, all up. So for employing 50 people, it's, it's not a huge amount of timber, really. So the Tasmanian timber got very, very difficult in the early 2000s to get, and we'd get an order for a cooter boat, or, or, or we'd have a couple of forward orders for boats, and we'd order a, a little bit of stock and then we'd have to dry it and, and uh, you know, leave it there. So we, we experimented with the West African timbers and we found that they were very good. The durability was good. And all of a sudden in the 2000s, in the later two, 2008 and 10, around the financial uh, crisis, the paperwork, you couldn't just get the African timber just, just like that. You'd have to, it'd have to have a paperwork trail come, come, come with it. it. The ecology was very, very important. So we uh, then went to, uh, well, the same bloke actually left that call. The company, company went into liquidation and he went out by himself. And he sort of became a uh, timber agent for us. So he started sourcing the timber direct from the mill in, in Ghana. And um, and we would forward buy the mill, for, for, forward buy forward buy the timber. For example, now we've got a container on the water of a timber that you probably don't know of. It's called Cedrella. It's a um, a, 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 a regrowth timber. It's been in the ground for about 50, 40 or 50 years. And I'm a very much a history buff. And Slocum built the uh, Liberdade out of the Cedrella and sailed it back to the States years ago. So I thought if it was okay for Slocum, it's okay for Phillips. So we're very, very, very happy to use it. And we now, we have a 40 foot container of that on the water. That was ordered about 12 or 13 months ago and we hope to get that in, in March. So that'll be the, what we mostly use for this year apart from the cabin sides, which we use old growth uh, Aroco on, and sometimes we use teak, a, a little bit of teak. But I'm really sad to say, we don't use practically any Tasmanian timber, timber anymore because it's, it's just not available to us. We just can't, we just can't purchase it. We would love to, you know, love to use the product if we, if we could get it, but it's just not available. Um, most of the boats that we build in the later years are strip planked, although we, we are running one 38 foot carvel boat through at present. But all the strip plank boats are built from Cedrella planking and they're glassed on the, 
of epoxy glassed on the inside and outside. So although the Cedrella is the same durability as, say, the King Billy Pine, it's a dura durability too, and its weight is very, all, all these boats that we build now, their weight's very important for the performance of the boats, and we're trying to keep them as light as possible. The Cedrella, the Cedrella in that boat there is about 450 uh, kilograms per cubic metre. So wouldn't we love to use King Billy Pine? Of course, of course we wouldn't. We, you know, if we use King Billy Pine, we'd look at maybe finishing it clear on the inside in some, in some ways, but it's just, it's just not available. So um, that's the sort of, that's where we've gone as a, a, as a woodworking or as a boat building business. It, just one other thing before I finish that I, I would like to say that it, we, we all have a very high de degree of moral obligation to use the timber as well as possible. Nothing makes me uh, more sad to see a, a poorly built boat built with beautiful um, old, growth, old growth timber. So the, the timber is, the, 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 it's not just the procurement of the timber, it's the usage of the timber and, and, and the artistry or the craftsmanship of building, building the timber. Like, we employ a lot of people and there's a lot of people hang off our, you know, of, of those 40 or 50 people, there's probably another 150 or 200 or maybe even more hanging off our shirt tails. Uh, and it's just so important, so, so important that the resource is used as the best possible way we can. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And it's great to get a sense of the chronology over those, marking each of those decades, and then to, to see what you're wrestling with globally to get resource and then to bring it back to ethics and passion and artisanship is really what we're here um, for today. So thank you. Um, Ian, we might go with, uh, with you and then hear from the video from the minister because I think we're on a roll with the passion. Is that all right? Um, nobody knows Ian Johnson. Nobody knows he's a maverick, loudmouth rat bag. Um, <laughs> Nobody knows he, oft he has one of the world's uh, most bizarre uh, collections of waistcoats. Um, and, uh, but he also has a depth of knowledge and passion. Um, and that's in, in boats, but it's also he, he helped bring up Lockie. I appreciate that forever. Uh, in, in just offering um, Lockie lots of advice not to take, but also lots of advice to take. So thanks, Ian, if you could do that for us today. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Um, I'm one of the three people who were sort of the founders of the Australian Wooden Boat Festival. There was just, uh, it was Cathy Hawkins, Andy Gamlin and myself, and we were just sort of sitting around sort of saying, gee, someone ought to do it. And um, we sort of thought that Australia, of all of Australia, Tasmania had the best facilities, the best traditions, the best, uh, most of the best boats. And also we still had a vibrant, boat building industry in Tasmania. This is 30 years ago. And so we very arrogantly grabbed the title Australian Wooden Boat Festival rather than the Hobart one. And we, you know, it's, it's just fantastic just to see how it's all going. And one of the greatest things that I've enjoyed of this particular festival is, is that there's so many young people involved. We've got Lockie and we've got two dozen really vibrant, uh, involved and passionate young people who look as though they're going to be pushing us old buggers out of the way and taking over the running of the festival. You know, we do have a really good future. Now, we, if, if we can get our timber supplies organised such that, you know, we've got an ongoing management plan, we can go on forever. There is timber out there. There are supplies out there. It's just that, it, you know, there's some d disagreement about the way it's managed. Just a very small amount of disagreement. Now, I'd like to have a, uh, a rave about two particular items that, um, but, you know, I can go on for hours if you want, but 
one of the reasons for starting the festival was to secure resource security for our industry. We are we putting in $20 million per year. This is Tasmanian boat builders putting into the Tasmanian economy. The festival itself puts in we, we will put 30 million directly into the Tasmanian economy for this festival, and it's probably in 80 million indirect as well. So you know we are a big we are a big part of the industry. The special species timbers that we use, less than one percent of the harvested forest is special species timbers, and that is 200 people, as is boat builders, but also furniture makers the beekeepers and all sorts of other people who use this. It is less than 1% of the harvested forest, but we put $100 million per annum into the Tasmanian economy. We are, we are significant, but we are desperate because we can see um, the management such that there is a rundown. There's a 54% reduction in the last 10 years, the availability of, celery, of special species timbers into Tassie. Uh, in Tassie, and the celery top pine, which is one of the last really good boat building timbers which is available, the Huon pine and King Billy pine is no longer allowed to be cut, it's only salvaged, that's all that's happening with that. 99% reduction in availability in the last 10 years. And the timber is there in this reserve area, I'd like to talk about that in a sec, but first of all, what happens is that when they sign the Regional Forest Agreement, 25 years ago, part of it was an acknowledgement that um, things like boat building timber is going to be less available and we need to sort of have a reserve, a background, a wood bank so that when boat builders need timber they can go to the wood bank rather than wait for cowboy crane or others to actually get around to cutting it and then we've got to dry it and stuff like that. So we needed this wood bank and it was created and it's at the moment it is in a dirty, dusty shed in the in Jeeveston. That's not all of it. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. It's only a small proportion of this this entire area. This is the way it's set up. And the have we got a no? We haven't got a photo of the um, the firefighting is a single one-inch hose as a firefighting thing. Next, it's an open-sided shed. Next ember attack, we could lose the, our entire stockpile of boat building timber for the future of boat building. Okay, and we have begged these begged sustainable timbers for for many years. You know, hey, listen, let's let's put it in a nice, safe place so that we this this is our future, and we'd really like to sort of see that happen. And um, what's also happening is that we need to add to this stockpile. It needs to be audited. There's all sorts of stories that has been poached and substituted with lesser quality stuff. But also we need, we're going to need to have high quality eucalypt because we're, going to, we're just not going to have enough celery top pine. That needs to be added in for, for, um, uh, you know, for the future supplies. And every now and again there's an availability of, there's a big availability of some Kimberley pine underneath someone's shed and it'd be really nice if the government were able to sort of, sort of say, well, let's put that in the wood bank as well. This is, this is a, uh, an occasion where they actually had a couple of big celery top pine logs. It was such a big occasion that a dozen people came down, wooden boat people including Joy, and Captain Sarah came down to have a look at a couple of celery top pines logs. It was such an unusual occasion. We all went down there and we sort of said, you know, can we talk, the, uh, the CEO of Sustainable Timbers Tasmania was there for the photograph to say that he um, would um, communicate with the, with the community and basically he came down, they took the photos and he took it he left. He didn't want to engage. We were sort of saying, can you tell us about the management plans? Can you tell us about how we can stop this, this whole lot sort of doing it? You know, we, we, we want engagement from the industry, please. And basically, it, it, the other thing which I wanted to talk about was just that we, we have got, there's two areas. We've got the general, 
I'm oh, sorry, I'll stop waiting. Um, there, there are a general harvesting areas, very large area. Okay, what happened back, going about 10 years, there was an agreement and a, almost half of the forestry areas, state-owned forestry areas, was put into permanent reserves. So, you know, the, we do have very large areas in Tasmania which are in permanent reserves. They will never get harvested. But the, the other half, most of it is in one, in one big pile, and that's just the general harvesting. 90 to 95 per cent of this harvesting area, I'm not allowed to use acronyms, is, has already been clear filled and converted to eucalypt regrowth, fast growing eucalypt regrowth. There's about 5, 10 per cent of it left, and unfortunately, um, it's just basically getting clear filled. This uh, for, um, sustainable timber says we don't uh, clear fill old growth, okay? So, but this is not clear filling. This is called aggregated retention. Here's a 100 hectare coop, and you've got a little bit of forest maintained here. There's a little bit over in the corner there. This is aggregated retention, so we're not clear filling. But, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of seeing clear filling. And basically what we could do is we could harvest, where well, they've had trials to say, let's do selective harvesting. They've had successful trials. They can get in there and they can pull the mature trees out and leave most of the immature stuff so that there is a future. You know, we don't, we don't want it completely turned into eucalypt regrowth because eucalypt regrowth is very fire sensitive. It's because it is all eucalypt rather than just a mixture, mixture of rainforest and eucalypt. They, when they burn, they burn catastrophically and everything is completely destroyed. Whereas an old growth fire basically, you know, might kill 10, 20, 30% of the forest, but it recovers very quickly. And, you know, this is, this is not a recovery thing. They say they're not wasting timber. This is, this is one of these coops. That's a pile of, uh, it's not a very good quality photo. That's a pile of celery top pine logs. They're a bit small for boat building. They probably need another 100 years to increase their diameter. We need, we need 400, 600 year old trees to give us celery top pine. These are, you know, they need another 100 years, but they were felled, someone dragged them to the, uh, to the landing and they said, no, nah, you know, no one want them, they're too small. You know, we can't, you can't use the first couple of inches of the, of the bark, you can't use the middle of the tree and there's not enough in between to give you quality timber. And so it's just basically burnt. It just, you know, they just stuck a match to it and, you know, it's still happening. You know, the, you know there's the denial that it's happening, but we can go into these na mature native forests and we can harvest selectively. One of the things that they're doing, they've changed the definitions of harvesting. It used to be 10% of a, an area, if it was over 100 years old, was an old growth. Now what they've done is they've changed the definition. It's got to be 25%. It's got to be over 100 years old. This is the basal area. This is the, uh, the surface area at chest height. So they've, they've changed it from 10% to 25%. And then they sort of said, well, well, let's have a look at a coop. If less than 25% of the coop is old growth, it doesn't rate as old growth, so we can clear fill it. And now what they've done is they've combined their, their uh, definitions so that um, native forest, regrowth forest, and old growth forest are all under the same harvesting, um, uh, uh, under the same definition, which is native forest. So old growth and regrowth are basically native forest now, and so we can't look at the statistics, but 6,395 hectares of native forest were harvested, Clearfield last year. How am I going with time, Scott? Uh, it's 10 minutes and 55 seconds, but you are quite interesting as a person, so go another. Oh, yeah, give us, okay, well, you know, I've written all these notes down. You will have two minutes more. Right, oh, thank you, Scott. 75% um, of special species timber so is sold as saw log and is sent overseas or interstate. You know, 
you know, hey, well, let's, you know, we only want a small amount, let's keep it in the state. You know, you know we, can, we can do that. Sorry, mate. <laughs> There's not enough for you. <laughs> I'm really sorry. And, you know, we've got to accept that we've got, uh, we need, um, we need um, eucalypt. We are going to have to use eucalypt. But there's a huge difference in the quality of eucalypt. If it's growing very quickly, oh, I've got another photo. Here we go. This is the difference between old growth and regrowth. The bottom one, is, it's actually Oregon, but the bottom one is richer in colour, very close grained, durable, strong, the top stuff, you could turn it into pulp, you know, it will, it will, and wipe your bottom with it, but it'll never do as a, we'll, we'll talk about that in the Q&A bit, but we can, never, we can never use that for boat building, and this is the stuff we want. It's stronger, it's more stable, it's more durable, and it's more beautiful, it's got the colours, and, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing which we want. What's the other photo? Oh. Here's a photo of a clear fell coop. Uh, the, the trees are about 20 years old. Most of it got knocked down and um, taken, whole log exports, so zero value adding. And this, this coop contained probably 10,000 immature celery top pine and they just sort of clear felled it. You know, there's a lot, we've got a lot of photos of this sort of stuff. And it's, it sort of reflects it. It's, it's nice and shiny on the outside and rotten in the middle. What have I done? Oh, that's enough. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, sadly, uh, you didn't use a single acronym, so there's no free beers letter. Um, but uh, thank you, Ian. It's really interesting to, to hear your passion and to, and the, the, the depth of your experience and the way that that comes out in, the, in, in putting your words together. And I really thank you for keeping it uh, passionate but also forward looking, because in the end, the old fights won't get us into the future. So I really appreciate it. And we will be able to approach some of those bigger questions in the Q&A. Um, and it's interesting to hear that building on the the questions of ethics that, that Tim was bringing up. So we're building in a really strong direction. Um, with the word ethics and, uh, the, and stewarding for the future and those things, it'd be really interesting just to hear what the minister, uh, Felix Ellis, um, uh, has for us and then to go to, to Captain. Um, if we can... I don't know, but we will speak to our genius millennial. Um, so look, just to put it in context, it, it is in the second half, the back end of an electoral cycle. It is not easy for a minister to um, stand anywhere within the ballpark of the word forestry. Um, he, I did have a meeting with him, did say that, that this would be a place that he could speak. We wanted him to speak from the heart. Um, we all know that there are big interests at stake. We all know that there are ethics at stake. And it is a continued conversation. Um, and Felix, um, he, he'll explain that he's on paternity leave and that's a good thing. So he couldn't be here in person, but he did uh, probably go against his advisers and, and said, yeah, I'll, I'll contribute a video. I'm gonna keep talking without using any f full stops or punctuation um, while the millennial next to me finds the video because he's a genius. Um, I look younger than I am. Oh, he's... I can give you the USB if you want. Uh, and then I promptly stopped talking, so... Keep talking, stop. Keep talking. Um, Keep talking. Does any, would anybody like to ask in one question, or Tim, one question while we're finding this? Yeah. Do you mind, with the questions, just so it remains in the right space, could you um, tell us your name? Start with your name. Uh, my name's Tom. Um, I saw your book in Demick's bookshop. Um, what is a rata? Oh, it's not in the dictionary. Uh, okay. Can I not answer that because we're? Tr can I not answer that because we're trying to stick to the to the wood forum? Oh. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. But that's all right. But you know, let's let's stick to the uh, the wood the wood subjects. Uh, the lady up the back with her. Hand. Do you mind saying your name? For, so we. As, as 
boat owners, maybe not boat builders, to help open up this communication with sustainable timbers, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to write letters? Do you want us to chain ourselves to something? Um, you know, just generally protest. What, what can we do to open up that voice and give it some power? Jane, really appreciate that question. Um, the guiding, obviously we wouldn't tell um, people what to do, but the, the guiding principle will be respect for the, the public servants and the respect for the knowledge in this room. Public servants and certainly ministers will know nothing of the depth of information of many people in the audience and certainly the people here. So what we need to do is bridge that gap and writing to an MP is taken much more seriously. I forget the current stat um, on a paper letter um, is 200 constituents and a, an email is slightly less and I think they take socials is at a different level. But um, do that and, and then it's just this one thing. Um, very ordinary people in extraordinary jobs, just, um, just arrange to have a meeting with, with your local member and do a bit of research about their relationship with the minister because not everybody in every political party is friend friendly with each other. So it's just do the work that lobbyists do and then state the case moving forward rather than um, based on the past. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll, we've got the, do you mind if we come to the questions in a minute? Um, great. So you'll be first. I don't know your name. We'll play the video. Thanks. Good morning and welcome to this morning's forum at the 2023 Australian Wooden Boat Festival. My name is Felix Ellis, your Minister for Resources, and I would have loved to have been with you there in person today, but I'm currently on paternity leave given the recent birth of my second son, Michael. So please excuse the bags under my eyes. Wooden boats are part of the Tasmanian story. Our island geography and rich forests naturally leads to this place being a centre of wooden boat building. From our earliest days, ships and boats made with timber from our forests have sailed our shores. From the great vessels that travelled from here to Europe and back, through to the dinghies used by locals as they pulled in. Cooter from the channel or lobster from our coasts, Tasmanians, timber and water have always gone together. While eucalypt was often used for seagoing vessels, many smaller boats were and are built from our beautiful and unique specialty timbers. King Billy, Celery Top, Hewitt, iconic species with a mystique and beauty all of their own. Arguably, part of what makes this place, our island home, so special. Largely speaking, these beautiful timbers have come from the state's public native forest estate. They've helped give rise to a wooden boat building craft in Tasmania that is not only part of our history, but a contributor to our economy today. I want to see this continue. I want to see future Tasmanians sailing our waters in boats made with timbers from our sustainably managed native forests. One of the greatest single impacts to the supply of special species timber in Tasmania was the Tasmanian Forests Agreement, which halved the public forest estate. The loss of resource was a contributing factor to the current government developing the Tasmanian Special Species Management Plan. The plan provides a framework for the long-term sustainable harvesting of special species timber uh, and has been provided to be utilised by industry. But a five-year review of the plan is currently underway and the government, particularly me as Minister, will be seeking feedback from the special species, special species timber sector, such as yourselves, as part of the process. Forums such as today's also play a valuable role in bringing feedback on supply, access and other matters to the fore. This is of particular importance given feedback from some in the sector around difficulties in obtaining timber in the volume or grade of soil. I look forward to hearing the outcome of today's forum. Again, my apologies for being unable to be there in person today, but all the best for today's discussion. I look forward to hearing from you soon and attending the next Wooden Boat Festival. That's from the Minister, and uh, we thank him for taking the time to do that. Um, now, uh, it's a privilege to introduce someone that everybody probably knows, um, Captain Sarah Parry, builder of the Windward Bound, establishing the Windward Bound Trust, has worked with countless uh, young people, um, young people facing significant disadvantage, has um, poured her heart and soul into both a better community 
and, uh, and better wooden boats. So it's a privilege to hear your thoughts. If, if you could talk passionately, like the others, from your heart. Thank you, Ian. I'm not generally known for talking passionately, I believe. However, um, this is a very interesting session. It's a very interesting and most wonderful group of people uh, to talk to because I'm a, I've been a Bodhi all my, all my life. Uh, I had the joy of learning, of being introduced to boats at, at about age eight and uh, in Sydney and um, I came to Tasmania accidentally because in 1972 I came down for a long weekend, an Australia Day weekend and um, I partly felt at home uh, and felt very at home but I was absolutely stunned by the fact that no one was here and because I asked the local is there something happening on the other side of Tasmania that everybody's gone to? And he said, why? And I said, well, but there's nobody around. There's hardly any cars and there's not many people. And he looked around and he said, oh, no, it's about normal. <laughs> and I thought, if that's normal, I'm in the wrong place. And so I worked very hard at, at, at looking at coming down and two years later I moved down here. And that was in 1974 and I've been here ever since. And I've been involved in woodworking and boat work and boating uh, down here. I actually sold my boat in Sydney because I said, I'm going to Tasmania, it's too cold down there. I'm never going to go boating. I lasted three months before I bought another boat. I, I, I have a, a marine dictionary uh, on board Windward Bound and the definition for abandon uh, is the state in which a sailor buys a boat. And I think I'm probably looking around the room, I'm probably looking at whole people who are one, once or twice in their life been uh, of a gay abandon and are very grateful for it. Now, on the sub serious side of the subject we're talking about, um, when I built Windward Bound, I have to tell you that I had never built a boat in my life. I'd worked on boats, I'd repaired boats, uh, I was very involved with the Sydney Heritage Fleet for a long time. Um, in fact, I had the privilege of being on the board that made the decision to get hold of the James Craig off the mud bank in Research Bay, so um, that was a good outcome. But I had no serious experience, and, um, but I was a cabinet maker. And I'd haunted the boatyards and talked to many of the boat builders. And in fact, we lost one of those precious people just recently. They're not strafing us here, are they? The minister doing something. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, Bill Foster, who passed away just recently, and, and his funeral is on Tuesday. Uh, Bill was my mentor uh, back when I first started dabbling in wooden boats in Tasmania, and I got to know Bill. And Bill's an extraordinary human being, like most Tasmanian boat builders are, and people like Max Crease and various other people I spoke to had no hesitation in looking at this person who was asking all these silly questions and saying, Why do, what do you call that bit there? Oh, it's a stealer. Why do you call it a stealer? Uh, Etc. And because they just love their, pro their craft. They love looking after people, and they, they love people who are interested in what they did. And it was through Bill, when I raised the issue with Bill of building Windward Bound, uh, he didn't poo-poo it, didn't raise his eyebrows, didn't do anything. He just said, what do you need to know? And I, by that stage, and I decided to build Windward Bound. The reason I'm telling you all this is because it's leading to what I see as the, the only, one of the only futures for, for timber in boat building. Um, when I built, decided to build Windward Bound, I was an avid reader of Wooden Boat, had been for many, many years, and in Wooden Boat, they, they were far ahead of us in America uh, in their uh, strip planking and various other things. And I, I discovered from Bill that uh, strip planking was a, a traditional way of building boats in Tasmania. However, to me, they did it the hard way because they had to, still had to bevel all the edges of their planks to get them to roll around the frames. Uh, the American strip planking, it, which had been done for 160 odd years at that stage, it's about 180 years now, it was a traditional way of building in, in America. Uh, and, but they, did, they had, did it differently. They did what we did, or we did what they did, I should say, and we hollowed out the top of the, uh, the plank and rounded off the bottom of the plank. So when it, and they were two, inch, two and a half inches wide, the planks, two inches thick. And by doing that, we were able to roll them around the frames without having to do any beveling or any shaping. Now, we all have different opinions about various things American. However, they are very, very good at that sort of innovation. 
and it, and it saved a massive amount of timber, which is, where, which is sort of where I'm coming to. The other thing that I found out from them, in fact, Bill, Bill and um, uh, the, sur the survey people and I had spent a considerable amount of time trying to fine tune that curve to get it right. And I opened my next issue of Wooden Boat and the front cover said, uh, uh, strip planking, working out your profile. And I couldn't believe it. And so I opened it, went straight to it, and there was the answer. It's just the radius, isn't it? Uh, but, um, it made all, but they came up with another great idea, and that was to round the top of that radius off. So if, you've got to, if you imagine you're hollow, you round the top off, it, take, it saves 10 millimetres of timber. Now, that doesn't seem a lot. But on Windward Bound, there are 100 planks on each side of the ship. And 100 times 10 millimetres is a whole metre by 80 feet long. That's getting, that shows my age, doesn't it? I'm going back to the other. But um, that is, it's a massive saving in timber. And I think that's where we've got to go when it comes with the timber use of the future. We've got to be smarter, not better. We've got to be smarter about how we use it. And, the, and with the epoxy glues and everything we've got these days, laminating is perfectly acceptable. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't repair an old boat, like Mistral, for instance, by traditionally planking out, replacing planks in the traditional way. We don't want to change that. But we are in Mistral uh, laminating things like the shear clamps and beam shells. Now, we didn't realise we had to replace those when we got hold of it, but we, we, we have. We've completely replaced them. And instead of having one beam bolted to another beam over 80 feet long, and they were eight by two, I think they were, uh, the, the shear clamps in Mistral, we did exactly the same thing by laminating Douglas fir. And we've now got a monocoque beam, which is the beam shelf and shear clamp complete, many times stronger than what was in it before. And, and by soaking it and saturating it with, a, with epoxy, such as uh, Waddle Sea Pro or Everdure, you keep the water right out of the wood and you save it and it stays there. And you don't have to restore it in 20 years' time or 50 years' time or 100 years' time because it will, it will last the distance. Down in the Franklin, uh, sorry, down at Franklin, in the river, in the Hewan River, 20 years ago, the wooden boat school built a, a um, radiator pine. Now, I'm not advocating the use of radiator pine as a boat building material, but they built a radiator pine dinghy saturated with Everdure, and that dinghy's still floating in the river now, 20 years later. That's the power of the epoxy, is what I'm trying to point out, not the power of the timber. It's, it's rubbish timber, but it's good for, for purpose sometimes. We're using radiator pine in Mistral to mock up parts that we have to yet work out that aren't shown on the original drawings. A classic example is the forecastle hatch that we're uh, making a mock up of in the, um, um, the noisy boatyard. Uh, well, the, um, all we had to work with, with that, was a photograph of a Seekers song album that had a photograph on the cover of Mistral's forehatch. So, we could, we, could, we could just go ahead and build it out of teak, but if we do it and it's not right, we're trying to get it exact as, to what it was. If we build it out of teak, there are four pieces of teak sitting on the workbench over there, $400 worth. Are we going to waste the teak? No. We're going to do it out, mock it up out of radiator, get it right, and then build it out of teak. And there's a lot of room for doing that sort of thing in the industry to save waste. One of the advantages of strip planking is that when you carve a plank, you start out with a plank so wide in the middle of the boat, by the time you get to the end of it, it's about that wide. And all that offcut, if you can't use it for something else, particularly the small offcuts, is waste. The wood's too precious to waste. We need to get our head around being much more practical with how we go. If you laminate, you, um, you, like for instance in Windward Bound, our hull is two inches thick. Now, we had to build it two inches thick to meet survey, we could, the, the architect said we could have got away with an inch and a half if, it, if the boat wasn't in survey. If we'd built it out of celery top, it would have been three inches thick. If we'd built it out of Hewan, which they wouldn't let us do because we were strip planking, um, it would be even thicker. So these are the things we have to consider when we're looking at how we're going to go work into the future with the boat building materials. Windward bound is planking swamp gum. There's nothing wrong with eucalypt. It's tough timber, it's good timber, and it glues really well. We don't have to, we can preserve all our good timbers like Hewan and various other things for better purposes. In, in Mistral, we're, we're meeting a balance because we're putting Mistral into survey. That's caused us a few issues as well. We're only allowed to use, in our framing in Mistral, only allowed to use hardwood or Douglas fir. We're not allowed to use anything else. That's just to meet the survey requirements. 
but we are reframing in blue gum. She's double sawn frame. We're meeting that with double sawn framing. We were lucky enough to get a whole pile of wide, thick, dry blue gum we've been able to cut the frames out of. But what I'm saying is, I guess in all of that is, look outside the square. Look at the way other people are doing it. Look at the Americans on how they're doing stuff. Yes, they've got some good timbers over there. I don't have no idea about what their, their supply issues are like, but I suspect they're not much different to ours. We've got to just think better. And there's nothing absolutely wrong with epoxy and laminating. That, 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 am I Ten minutes exactly. Outside? Ten minutes exactly. So that's, that, that's, that's my word to the industry. It works. We've proven it. Windward Bound is now 25 years old. If you go down into the bilges and lift the ballast out, she's as good as the day she went in the water. And she's put together with epoxy. She's, she's epoxy glued and she's also mechanically fastened as well. But she's a standing thing. She, we could not build, I doubt we could build Windward Bound now just to get that, that volume of, of, um, of, um, blue, of um, swamp gum to do it. And to do it in a traditional way with traditional planking, you just wouldn't get the timber now. Peter Harris is a, a bit of an expert at finding all this sort of stuff. And I'm looking forward to what, what he's got to tell you. But I know some of the stuff that the, the trials and tribulations Peter's gone through to do what he did traditionally. But that's, that's my input. Just think outside the square. Trust epoxy, trust laminating. Laminating is fantastic to reduce the requirement and we can get smaller pieces out of logs that we can't get big pieces out of. Great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Captain Sarah. It did cost a fortune to get the, the roulettes to fly over and um, Joy, the chair, and Mike, the, the vice chair of, you know, uh, I don't know what you're going to do to fundraise that, but there we are. Um, Really appreciate that input, smarter, working smarter, smarter use of timber, uh, thinking outside the square. Um, we're going to uh, move into what is the Q&A session and to guide us into that, we're going to ask Hannah to come and sit up here as well um, to, to give us, the, again, return us to the future focus. Just acknowledging here that when a, a white middle age, middle class dude is speaking, somebody else isn't, so we're really grateful that you, you put your hand up to, to come and speak. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about your experience and you know, just a couple of minutes to get you on the floor with the others and then we'll bring Peter down as well. Um, I'm Hannah, I um, did the uh, one year course at the Wooden Boat Centre in Franklin two years ago um, and they hired me at the beginning of last year. So I'm only in my third year of boat building. I'm very amateur still. So I feel super lucky to be here with you guys and yeah, listening to your knowledge and um, yeah, input into the future of boat building. Um, yeah, I don't know what <laughs> what, what would your um, dream be? Just, just imagine you, you've got mentors and you can be anywhere in five years' time. What would that be in regards to boat building? Oh, I don't know. I have, I, to be honest, I don't think about it much at the moment. I'm just uh, trying to uh, get as much skills as I can in boat building. Because I started um, the course with zero woodworking skills. so. Um, at the moment, I'm just taking it day by day, to be honest, and trying to improve my skills and, um, yeah, gather as much knowledge as I can. And, yeah, I agree with Sarah that um, it, it's about, like, thinking more smartly in, in, the, in your initial use of timber and um, using, like, a mixture of uh, traditional skills and epoxy, for example, like, yeah, new, new skills and... Materials, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very un uh, like underprepared. That's good. <laughs> we, you're like the rest of us. Um, last question: What, what if you were using uh, three words to describe what it's like to make something out of wood? What would you use? What would the three words be? Um, On the microphone. <laughs> I guess it's quite romantic. Um, using hue and pine, like I often have to, I'm like walking through the workshop and a beautiful piece of hue and pine like captures my eye, at, like the colours and how the light hits it, it's like very romantic. <laughs> um, what else? It's I, two words like nerve-wracking, 
like cutting into a huge plank of human pine is very nerve-wracking. <laughs> um, what's the third word? Uh, Exciting, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Great. It's, it's really good to, rem to remind ourselves of that, of the romance and the excitement, and that it is, um, as Captain Sarah said, it is uh, something to, to be responsible about and to, to think around. And as Tim said, there are ethical issues when you're cutting into timber. And, and it's a really great perspective. So it really worked to bring you up. Peter, would you mind joining us? We'll just bring another chair to the table, if you don't mind. Um, and again, it's, a, it's getting just another um, perspective from an audience member, a, a little bit more about um, the scale, things of scale and passion. Thank you. Thanks very much, and uh, just a, a few comments. And in, in some ways, Sarah has already um, laid the groundwork for what I'm uh, going to say, that uh, we have, in restoring and rebuilding Amadopo, tried to do it as traditionally as possible. So 10 years ago, when we bought the ship back from Port Macquarie and saw the extent of the work that we were going to have to do, we realized that we would have to replank the ship. Um, and one of the first things I did was think about who are my mentors and guides. And so I rang Sarah <laughs> and I said, what did you use to build Windward Bound? And she said, oh, we used um, swamp gum. I said, oh, that's good. So that's a Tasmanian timber. So I rang Tasmanian Forest and said, uh, I need uh, about 50 tons of, uh, of three inch, um, more than six meter long planks uh, made out of swamp gum. And they said, oh yes, well we can, we can let you have that in about three weeks. And I rang a lot of other timber yards around the place and all of, almost all the salespeople said, yes, I can supply whatever you want in about three weeks. And three months later, nobody had ever replied. So I rang one person and I said, so why did you not reply? And they said, we thought you were a lunatic. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what was the point of replying to somebody who has no idea about timber? <laughs> so so I, anyway, I took that as, it was probably true, anybody who took on that ship was probably verging on a lunatic. But we kept going and I tried to find out what was swamp gum. Well, Sarah told me it was eucalyptus oblique. Uh, Sorry, regular. And well, here I see. So I'm still totally confused because I thought oblique had these little leaves like that and regulars had big leaves. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so they said we could send you uh, this um, swamp gum. Then I discovered that on the other side of the valley it's called something different. And then I discovered that actually Taz Forest really didn't know what they had. So we had a long discussion about this and then eventually they said, well, we could send you 75 tonnes of uncut logs uh, of messmate. And I said, so what's messmate? They said, well, it's another timber that's very good from Tasmania. <laughs> and only last week somebody told me that actually uh, flooded, uh, uh, not flooded gum, um, eucalyptus, uh, 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 so swamp gum, is messmate. So now I'm totally confused. I actually had no idea. And then I discovered that actually, when you actually dig into this, it depends where it comes from, what species it is. There are three and a half thousand basic species of eucalypt. And when they come to Tasmania, uh, and other places as well, they hybridize with other things. And they live in different places at different heights in the hills, and they have different properties. So you can't just ask a simple question about, I want this amount of timber. So in the end, we decided that Tasmania wasn't going to be able to help us. And they said, we might have some King Billy pine. And I said, oh, I don't think we can build a ship out of pine. I don't, it's not proper timber. You know, Alma was built in northern New South Wales out of eucalypts. And she was built out of flooded gum and uh, iron bar and spotted gum and a thing called Sydney blue gum, which turns out to be any one of a hundred different species. It's somewhere near Sydney and it's something like blue and it's very hard. So I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm just fresh out from, from the UK and I'm sort of trying to put all this together. So I said, all right. So I decided, who else can I talk to? So Tori Gunnison was still alive. And I said, Tori, you've been very helpful to the ship and you've given us a lot of Queensland White Beach. 
So, uh, and he said, yeah, but I'm not in the timber business anymore, I can't help you, but what I could do is tell you who to go and talk to, or roughly where he lives, but I can't tell you his name. So he said, but what you need is spotted gum, and you need lots of it, and it's got to be what your shipwright says, which is it needs to be three inches thick, it needs to have no heartwood, no softwood, softwood, no... Uh, no gum veins and no defects, which is what the uh, house builders called features or character, but that's what we call defects. So you, if you can find that. So off I go to find somebody, bang all the sawmills. Eventually I came across somebody who was a third generation spotted gum sawmiller, whose friends that he grew up with and his family grew up were third generation spotted gum foresters and they talk only spotted gum. If you want an iron bark, you go to the iron bark person. But he said, no son, he calls me son. Uh, I can't talk to you about anything else. I can't talk. come up and talk to me about spotted gum. So off we go. And he said, I think I can do what you want, but hurry. And for 10 years, he supplied us with spotted gum. Uh, first quality spotted gum. And if there's any defects, they replace it with something else. So he's taken logs spotted gum and he's taken those to uh, because you can only get five on a log truck you take a convoy of log trucks to a mill which is hasn't been shortened to so that timber fits in a container and it comes up at up to eight meters long and a convoy goes from one place in New South Wales to another place to the one saw mill that can now cut it uh, and I now that we've finished it it may well be that we will be the last people ever to do this Mm. So that's hull planking, and the second issue that I wanted to just talk about was what do you do about framing? What we might do, Peter, if, without being um, no, rude, if we could bring that into the question uh, and answer session. Ask um, about framing. <laughs> ask about framing. Um, but the, the idea of the complexity of what you're dealing with was crystal clear there, and, and thanks very much for that. We want to be fair on the audience, so we're going to go with half an hour of questions, and we do have to be out of the building at a very specific time. So you were first. Would you mind saying your name? We'll bring microphones to you somehow. Sounds like a thespian voice, an actor's voice. It's not a, an, a question, but what I wanted to say based on from what Jane was saying, what can we do? We're all distressed, time is of the essence. Can I suggest the only way that anything will be done is to draft an email that can be sent readily to lots of supporters. It's been done very successfully to stop development down here. And I suggest that email also has the key points that need to be addressed, especially the economics. I'm going to have to pull you up. Thank you. Um, we've got that point, but we did promise that we would be asking questions, not making statements. So I'm going to hold you to that. I will be a tyrant, um, but we, we understand that we need to email, we need to communicate, we need to be passionate about it. So thank you very much. But it needs someone to do it and send it to everybody. Okay, appreciate that. And make sure the minister listens thank, to thank this. Thank you. Questions, no statements, appreciate it. The, the gentleman with his hand in the air. I'll try and keep my eyes out, but if I miss someone, please wave. to know, do we have any understanding of what the resource is in Lake Pedda? Is there any knowledge of what's down there? Bugger all. Really? Okay, thank you. Or not thank Beg you. your pardon, uh, Ian, can just say that more clearly? Uh, <laughs> very little. Um, what, what, what happened, what happened uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, uh, the, lake, the, the level of Lake Pedder went down a lot and someone was actually doing some salvaging in Lake Pedder and they just said for 20 grand we'll, we'll pull all the logs back into the, into the lake um, and we can do that for you, no problems at all. And uh, FT said, said, no, no, it's all right mate, uh, we're not going to spend 20 grand on that. And about a week later, um, my exaggeration, a uh, big fire went through, we lost a lot of it, got burnt and um, the most, almost all of the rest of it was actually pulled out and taken to Strawn, where it's in a stockpile. And it's in fairly good nick, but uh, you know, we did lose quite a lot of it, unfortunately. Thanks, Ian, for the answer, and thanks that, for using an acronym. We'll see him at the bar later. <laughs> um, yes, 
uh, want to get a mix of genders in the questions if we can. You, you sir. What, do you mind saying your name so we're on equal footing? Sure. Peter Richardson. Um, I, we heard very interestingly about lamination and epoxy being used to make better use of smaller bits of timber. Um, a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago, there was an exhibition at the Powerhouse in Sydney of furniture uh, where the timber had, I think, been pressure treated and microwaved or something like that. And the furniture was like the chairs you're sitting on, timber, but very thin members, very strong because of the treatment. Are there other ways of treating timber, modern ways of treating timber that can make better use of smaller bits of timber, thinner bits of timber, younger growth? I think we better reframe, if it's all right with you, reframe it and send it to Tim. Tim, tell us about the difference between using epoxies. Uh, is it worth using lesser quality timbers with good quality epoxies or what's the, what's the market advantage in building a boat out of premium timber as opposed to lesser timber soaked in something? Well, generally we'd build carvel or clinker vessels, small smaller clinker vessels or larger carvel vessels out of a premium timber um, with soaking it with soaking it in epoxy or with epoxy coating it on the inside and outside that's the scenario of keeping the water ingress out of the timber and providing you can do that you can use a lot lesser uh, durability type in, in the timber, which is, I think, what Sarah was uh, talking, talking to. So, for, for example, the, the uh, line of boats that we build, we build out of a durability to timber. They're expensive boats and we're very careful not to get any ingress of water into them. When we build a carvel boat, we really need, well, it, it is best to build it out of a durability one timber, although it's not widely known that celery top pine is a, only a durability two timber. Thank you. Just, um, we, we'll come to questions in this room. Uh, so you know there are 30 or 40 people outside. We, because of the fire restrictions, etc. they can't be in here. It's great to have that passion. We may have a question from outside. This may freak the tech out because they're taking a microphone out there. Oh, one here. One here. Yeah, Excellent. Come. That's good to bring a person in momentarily. Uh, I'm Craig Brown, conservationist. And the question is, um, should we not restrict the use of special timbers? There's form and there's form and function. Boats are form and function, beautiful. Form, such as uh, wall panelling and so forth, inappropriate. They took all that... Uh, Blackheart Sassafras out the Q River for wall panelling, inappropriate, but for boats it's beaut. And how can we make that selective logging terrific? And I see the mention of helicopter there. Are there other ideas, please? Okay, if the question was unclear, there, it was coming back to the ethics of the use of the, the wood and how can we, uh, how can we, what is world's best practice selective logging and how can we do that? Is that a good pricey? Yeah, thanks. Thank, thanks very much. Um, who will take that question? Um, Ian, if you'd like to take it, my stopwatch is going. Answers under two minutes, please. Um, yes, we can. Uh, there ha have been trials of selective harvesting, and it's just a matter of being able to sort of go into a forest and pull out the mature trees, and but leave the forest as basically an intact mixed age, mixed species forest. We don't know what's happening with climate change. Maybe this particular species of timber is going to die out and that particular species of timber will flourish as things change. We, we just don't know what is what we need in the future. So the idea is to sort of retain the natural forest as much as we possibly can and go in and just pull stuff out. Now there is some roading into some of these special species management areas and it would be worthwhile pulling even in, even with winches rather than going through and clear felling and just pulling out some mature trees. If we've got a large area, we can pull out a small amount of timber out of a large area and there's virtually no thing. Many places overseas are actually doing helicopter rogging. What the Kiwis are doing, they sort of said, you know, we want to build a boat. You put a chopper in, you grab hold of a particular tree and you pull it out and they can do it. 
we, so we can do it. We can, we can afford to do very low impact harvesting and that way we retain. Things like the big eucalypts, the tall eucalypts, which have got intrinsic value, they are really, really important. You know, we could have a, uh, a tourism industry for the big trees and, you know, and they're too hard to handle um, so, you know, why don't we leave them growing? Helicopter logging is, is a great way of doing it. And, you know, it would, we, we can still, if, okay, 10% um, of the cost of 30 boat, seconds. Yeah, yeah, 10% of the cost of the boat is timber, and 10% of the cost of the timber is in royalties. If we quadruple the royalties, it's only a very small increase in the value of a boat, but it means that there's value in this, in this timber and people can make a living, still make a living out of it. Thank you. Up the back. Do you mind saying your name and wait for a microphone if we can? Uh, we have a question here, sorry. Second back row. And please speak on the mic because we are recording this. It needs to go through the desk. Hi, my name's Lily. Um, is this practice of logging not, is it being done in a sense that there's not private companies out there doing it and there's no backing for it in that sense, or is it legislation reasons for why this timber's not being logged in this specific way, and is it, <laughs> sorry, might be too hard of a question, but are there avenues for people in private industry to do it for then boat builders to be buying off those specific companies, or are there stops? On the mic, please, Ian. The way to, the way to manage the forest has, has been drawn up. It's all, been, it's all there. They just need to enact, enact it. It's been around for about seven years. They haven't touched, they haven't looked at it. It's all drawn up. And basically, I reckon it's 90% good. We don't have to wait for another inquiry for 10 years. We don't have the time. Great. So if you could write to your MPs and say thank you for the pathway that has been created. Um, can you make sure this is enacted? We are passionate about it. Um, that would be very useful. And you can get the definitions off Ian later. Um, yeah, we'll just stick here and then come across. Just want to balance the room a little. Please state your name. Hi, my name's uh, Jen Sanger. Um, I'm a conservationist. Uh, I've got a question for the panel. So I understand that there's this need for specialty timbers for things like boat building, and there's a quite an important cultural history with that. Um, so how do we, how, what's your recommendation on how best to manage specialty timber resource? Because I, I would like to see this tradition keep going, but then also to, I don't feel like it's necessary for every rich entitled person to feel like they need a celery top um, coffee table, for instance. So um, is there any thoughts on this? Thanks. It's, it's a provocative question and a good one, and it does come to the, the heart of why so many of these uh, important questions end up in an adversarial fight. I think um, if I could jump in, the person that we'd love to put you in touch with is Andrew Denman, who can talk about um, best practice that doesn't endanger the forest and doesn't endanger the culture and allows us to move forward in ways that, that are ethical as boat builders and ethical as conservationists. There's a lot of issues ar around that and there are people, not me, with much more experience in um, not talking about exaggerated ideas, um, but very precise best practice, and, but it is a very critical issue. Thanks very much. Um, can you see us afterwards and we'll put you in touch? Yeah. Sorry, it's me again. And this ties into the other questions. Are we not missing, it's, it's wonderful to see the heritage of boat building continuing on because the younger generation coming up. Are we not missing talking to the forestry generation? Should we not be actually directly talking to the education of foresters and having that conversation directly? Um, and is that a gap that we could close and would that even be possible? Thanks for um, doing that as a question. Perhaps, Peter, you might um, talk about the education across the sector. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I did mention about the third generation foresters, so there was a time at which people were uh, trained, but not 
uh, actually through school or by, by colleges, but because that was the profession they were in. And I think one of the questions that would be worth asking is, uh, first of all, in response to the speaker before, how many people in the population care about the future of wooden boats or furniture or trees? And, and try to find out what is the strength of support for the plan that's being put up. And then that would be followed by how do, would you uh, educate people to understand that? And the Wooden Boat Festival is a great way to educate people in how to do this, but there are no numbers coming out. So what can we do? I believe that we can develop a simple, straightforward, meaningful, uh, numerically useful business case, which says there are so many people uh, proportion of the population interested in this. This is the number of dollars they're prepared to spend. This is the argument on both sides and put that to the government because I'm not sure that they have a business case for this. They may have a plan, but they, they want to see, I believe, a business case that they can respond to and they want to know how many people support it. I'm not can, sure that we I just Can I just jump in there just very brief, very briefly? Um, we tried to get Sustainable Timbers Tasmania to participate in the forum, but they didn't want to engage. And um, the, the Andrew Denman's mob, or his, the way he's sort of planning it, is he's suggesting we, you know, the management of special species timbers be taken, um, and those particular forests be taken away from Sustainable Timbers Tasmania because they have demonstrated that they're not, you know, they don't really. Not on our team, just... Well, uh, um, just to be clear, that there is a... When 99% of your work um, is one type of logging um, and, what, and the 1% tends to fall in, into the shadow of the business that's doing that, then it doesn't have a, a big chance. So that is a conversation for the Minister. None of it has gone really to your question. I think um, to make sure we move on and everybody gets a, a chance, please come down and talk it. Personally, I live in the northwest. I know logging families. I know foresters, and uh, and there are very high levels of literacy in those professions that do need to be respected in the conversation as we work forward for ethical uh, and conservation orientated outcomes. But I think one of the mistakes is when someone like me um, uh, doesn't give credence to to generations of work in parts of the Tasmanian community and I think there is a conversation to be had that is respectful and that's why I appreciated both those respectful questions and there is a way ahead within that. Um, if we could return in the, in the few minutes we have left to um, the future of boat building, uh, that would be terrific. Thank you. Do you mind saying your name and there will be a microphone, it's just here, sorry. Oh, your second. After, we'll come to you next, I didn't see the other Hello. Uh, Rob Horner small sawmiller in Westland, Victoria. Uh, thanks for the Wooden Boat Festival. This is my fifth and the third time coming in my own boat. Uh, Ian's comment, uh, I'm alarmed that 75% of saw log leaves the state in boxes. My guess is five or ten percent of that 75, you'll get clear grade uh, boat building timber. It's alarming to see that the logs are leaving in a log state. As a group of uh, boat builders, would it, I suggest, would it be good to get together with a certification scheme, for example, FSC, Forestry Stewardship Council. You see the emblem on the back of a lot of books you buy now. It's out of Germany, it's regarded as a leading environmental certification scheme. Vic Forests uh, couldn't get it uh, through because the main stumbling block is uh, stakeholder consultation. But I believe, I think uh, Tassie Forestry uh, have got some uh, of it in their management scheme. So as a, as a working uh, uh, a boat specialty timber group, we, we set the bar and bring the, the state management to our, our level of uh, management and, and insist on this high certification scheme. And you insist on it and the market will follow. C could you um, just turn it into a question for the floor? Do you, mind? Do, do you think the, the industry, the group, could 
look at a, a certification scheme and go to the management and say, this is what we, we want. Thanks very much for that answer. Is there an answer here, uh, Tim, or? It sounds like a great idea, but it's a very interested to, you know, hear the failure, you know, why it failed, really. Um, you know, it's so, you're talking eucalypt, I guess, hard, you know, hardwood rather than softwood. Uh, no, uh, for example, if you're the certification, it's worldwide. And they'd say the uh, 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 income from the sale of that timber, does it go to uh, small arms uh, sales? And it's, it's really thorough. Uh, the criteria is worldwide and, and they cover all aspects. I've moved it to the Western Victoria because of local uh, community involvement. I source my trees, so I move the business to the people who grow them. Is it, so, and one of them is, yeah, uh, Indigenous people. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, in, interesting, our timber comes through, mostly through Germany uh, with, the, with the German certification. So we don't, it, it go, comes by Europe because it's much more reliable coming by Europe than coming so, so, cor so corrupt in Africa. And the certification is questionable. So uh, all, all that, just about all our stuff now comes, come, comes through Europe. Yeah, um, the Sustainable Timbers Tasmania has been trying for 10 plus years to get Forest Stewardship Council certification and um, it has been unable to do it at the moment. The FFC, oh, sorry, um, is a flawed system. There, there are, critics have got legitimate arguments about the Forest Stewardship Council, uh, but it is the best of a relatively poor lot. And, you know, we haven't got it because of the management strategies in old growth forest. Okay, um, we've got five minutes and I did uh, misstep with your question and then we have to, because we have to be out of the building at a certain time. So keeping us future focused, the future of um, boat building timbers, etc. Uh, Andrew Purcell, wooden boat owner from Melbourne. It's my understanding that uh, last century a lot of these specialty timbers from Tasmania were used in the general construction industry, bridges and houses and things. Is there any place to repurpose and recycle some of these timbers that may be available? I mean, firstly, is it practical to use these timbers uh, for boat building, uh, given you know the fact they've been used in other other ways, uh, and can you get them in large enough sizes? And is this something that's ever been uh, explored? Thank you. That sounds like a, a question for Captain Sarah, because you have talked and about recycling. Um, whether it's practical, I don't know. But do you want me to recap the question? Or you... no, no, no. Um... Recycling is an excellent way of doing things. Uh, Windward Bound is comprised, the only new timber really in Windward Bound is in the hull planking. All the rest of it is recycled. Um, it came about because I um, was doing a photo shoot, I was working in an advertising agency at the time. Another long story, another rabbit hole, so we won't go there. But um, I was sent away on, a, on an assignment on the eye of the wind. And most of you in Tasmania would know, remember the Eye of the Wind. She was a lovely square rigger that used to come here frequently. And uh, I discovered, amongst other things on board, that there was lots and lots and lots of timber that had little repairs to it here and there. And I said to Tiger Tim, the captain, did you by any chance use recycled timber in this? He said, well, how else would you do it? He said, you just couldn't afford to do it any other way. So I went straight to the survey authority the next day when we got in and saw Barry Wilson, the surveyor, and many of you remember Barry, and I said, can I use recycled timber? He said, of course you can. He said, it's only the outside of recycled timber that's got a problem. Inside it, it's usually pretty good. And we demolished, uh, among other things, uh, dismantled is probably a better word than demolished, the old ferry exceller when she was up on the hard down at Kettering, 
and we recovered three container loads of hue and pine out of her. Uh, and it was all 50 mil worn deck planking and so on, 50 mil thick. We got 40 mil of good timber out of that, just simply by machining away the outside. There's absolutely nothing wrong. And with modern epoxies, you can plug and fill nail holes and screw holes quite satisfactorily. Obviously, it's probably not a great idea to do, use it in your hole planking because one of those screw holes might just pop under the pressure one night and you've got a problem. But uh, so we used new swamp gum, old growth swamp gum that was supplied through Australian newsprint mills um, uh, plantations, not plantations, but their, their uh, timber resources out in the, right out in the, in the back, backwoods. And um, uh, that was all new, but the rest of it was all recycled. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. And it meets survey requirements. So. Okay, um, I think we're going to need to wrap it up. Is that correct? We're about at the... Okay, we could, we have a couple of minutes, and while we think about the last question in the room, um, everybody take your phones out if you've got them and take a photo of that. Um, this will become the basis of, although I would say, um, try and cut it off, Ian, the bottom point, because that's, that's you being narky. And we want a positive pathway forward um, uh, and use that as the basis for the email from, I think it was Jane, I forget, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the emails that we're going to be sending. We, we do have a pathway there. It's about encouraging politicians to be best practice politicians. Remember, politicians can't do anything that is not legislatable. So a motion doesn't work in when you're talking with them. And we are in the, in the second part of the cycle. Um, the Wooden Boat Festival itself is not a political entity, but we do like to be encouraging discussion in the community. Um, and uh, as we move into, into that, um, has everybody got a photo? Because I'm just talking over the top of your photo taking. Um, we'll have one more question, and then we'll go a bit woo-woo, and I'll throw in um, a word cloud. Um, you have had a turn, and I really appreciate your um, passion for conservation. There was somebody else. It needs to be a question and not a statement to finish on. Is that good? Okay. Um, it's just the gentleman behind you who has put his hand up first. So if you wouldn't mind saying your name, I'd appreciate it. But I do thank you for your conservation passion. Uh, Michael Gregg from the WA Maritime Museum. I'm conscious that these are problems that occur throughout Australia. I mean, in WA, we have the issues of logging uh, old growth Jarrah and old growth Kerry. Is there, is there any better practice anywhere in Australia that we can all aspire to, that we can put forward as an example, or are we all in the same cart on the way to hell? That's actually a good question to, to conclude on. And Ian, maybe you and um, um, may, the table. I'm not sure who should go with that. But this is what we're going to do. This is what we're gonna, Ian, what we're going to do is what is your best practice that you know of? And we're going to go down the table and each person will, will speak to that. Give us some hope. The future. What have, okay, what's the, the best you've seen? The township of Franklin. Go down there and spend some time in the township of Franklin. See what the heart and passion of that place is, and listen to the people there. I, I, it's, a, it's a very hard question, isn't it? I can't get away from laminating, using smaller pieces of timber. One of the big advantages of laminating is it reduces the need for size, and that's very important. Again, on Windward Bound we were able to reduce every second frame on board by 50% because we had laminated frames and strip planks. That saved 25% of the framing timber of an 80 foot long, 120 ton ship. So that, that's the sort of consideration I think we need to look at looking outside the square. Um, yeah, as far as I know, there's no good examples around Australia of like, large scale use. Um, I did hear a story of a, uh, a for, like family-owned forest in um, the UK that was like um, third generation owned, and it was they specifically grew these trees for um, m boat masts, and I thought that was a beautiful, like sustainable story of uh, timber use. So maybe that's a good uh, thing for like to look to. I don't know. <laughs> 
being passionate about wooden boats, I see come across my email every week, sometimes more than once a week, people that have boats that they want to give away. We just came from the Tasman Peninsula and had a look at a boat yard and there's a there's a 50 footer over there built out of Jarrah and there's another one on the Hard or Hue and Pine, probably dating back to the 1890s and their giveaways. They're everywhere. We've got them in our own boat yard, giveaway boats. So there's definitely a great uh, resource of boats that are already built, whether you take them apart and rebuild them into something else or whether you restore them the way they are. But I've spoken to Joy and, uh, and, 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 and others, uh, Larry, and we're all getting inundated with people with old wooden boats and they've got, they just want to give them away. But because they're either out of fashion or it's not exactly the way they want to go, they're very hard, very hard to give away. So that's something that we haven't touched upon in this forum. Um, just a couple of examples to support things that have already been said, one by, by Sarah. The uh, recycling and, uh, and lamination techniques are obviously, over the next 10 years, are probably the thing that may save us while we're trying to get a better solution. Uh, Rob Horner, who spoke earlier, uh, thank you, Rob, for your brilliant work with the Alma. Uh, Resawing and uh, iron bark recycled from wharf timbers. The timbers under the deck and above the water have never seen uh, water. Thousands of metres of wharf are being taken away and turned into something you'd put in the garden. I mean, that timber's being ruined. So that timber can be taken away and we've then laminated that into steam bed frames. Uh, one more example is that uh, Tenacious, which was down here six years ago, was built out, laminated out of uh, newly cut Siberian larch from Nicholas I's forest, which he ordered 200 years ago. Uh, and they finally sent him back and said, government, your order is now ready, but unfortunately we don't use timber in, in uh, ships anymore. So that's laminated modern timber, and she's all epoxy and laminated, and she's 70 metres long. So, yeah, recycling, lamination. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Scott actually needs to jump into a speedboat and head out to join his son at the uh, Derwent Boat World Championships. I'd just like to say thank you, Scott. You're a great bloke and um, you kept us all under control. Thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thanks very much. I will just say this, that because um, it's a great question and there's been some very good questions. So little Lockie used to be a toddler, now he's a great big strapping lad. Him and his mates have bought a, a, a block that need, that's right next to the Tarkine that needs to become the Tarkine. He, is, he and an, another mate have a micro mill, very good at it. They, they want to restore the Derwent um, fleet. They, they are conservationists, they are cultural dudes, they are handsome, they, are, they need to be in a documentary. We've got to get word out that the future is in the concerns and the passions of the young. And I hope that we will reflect that this next forum and next festival with engagement with young people and young conservationists and young boat builders. Thank you.